Hello, my children. I am Vanilla Vape, and you are watching the Venom Vlog, hosted by my boy Seek. Take it from me that this is the best place for all things Venom and symbiote related. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Vanilla Vape, and follow me on Instagram at Wicked Vanilla Vape. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Blog. And today, as you saw, we have a new intro, and that was from Vanilla Vape. And he was actually our only person to enter the contest. So clearly, I maybe didn't do something right or, or didn't get you guys excited enough, which is totally on me. I totally understand. I figured a couple of you who have been asking about this Venom print for a while now, I figured, you know what, maybe this is a good way to get something for the channel, include some of the fans that watch the show and get them to do intros for the show, and then at the same time, pick one of them at random to win this. And I was hoping I would at least get four or five people to sign up and, and to send an intro in, but we just got Vanilla Vapes. But I actually really liked his, and uh, I thought it was pretty awesome, and it's very funny. Uh, so I have a link to his channel and his Instagram or his Twitter down below. So I'll put all that information down there, so please check them out. But Vanilla, I am going to send this to you. You won it fair and square. I had the contest. I said it was going to run till yesterday, which was August 15th, and I said by then I would pick a winner. And I was hoping Swordsman and a couple other people would enter, and I was trying to wait to the last minute. I was like, I'll wait till like 2 or 3 in the morning on the 16th today. I stayed up till like 4 a.m., and I was like waiting for you know someone else to send in the video. But since we didn't get one, Vanilla, you win, dude. <laughs> so thank you very much for your awesome intro. I really do like it, and I will include it between now and the movie coming out every once in a while along with the other intros that we have uh, so enjoy this uh, make sure you message me on twitter and give me your address or email me i know you have my email so uh shoot me an email give me your address and i will ship this out to you uh, as soon as possible i'll make sure I, I make sure it stays you know in great condition i'll put extra bags and boards in it or extra boards at least to keep it solid tape it up do whatever i got to do to make sure it uh, arrives to you in perfect condition so again thank you for that and everyone else uh you know i'll try better next time i saw a lot of people didn't want to enter the contest because I wasn't going to ship this, you know, internationally, and I understand completely. So I will try to come up with future contests. I'll try to do, you know, more digital giveaways or something or, or include international. The thing is, money is always an issue, obviously, and, uh, and also I don't have a lot of stuff to, to give out. So with this coming from Golden Apple, big thanks to them for giving us uh, this, you know, print so that way we can give it out on the show. And Vanilla, I'm glad it's going to a good home. Definitely check out his channel. All of his information is down below. And next contest, I'll try to think of something different, uh, something that maybe does include you guys, but also includes all of you guys, uh, which I understand. But for now, I'll just stick to giving out the digital codes because at least I know anywhere in the world you can get those. And that's something that I will definitely bring more to on this channel. Okay, now with that long intro out of the way, let's sink our teeth into the Warren Ellis run of Thunderbolts. Now, I'm not going to go into full detail on this run because we're going to talk about 12 issues here. And that's almost the most I've ever done on this show. I think the only time we top that is when we talk about Maximum Carnage and we try to condense that into one episode. And I chopped a lot out of it. That would have been a really long video if I didn't edit it out. And I think RNS Entertainment is about to do a very in-depth look at uh, Maximum Carnage. So make sure you tune into his channel. I can't wait for that episode. He's been working really hard on it, so I can't wait to see what he delivers. Uh, so today we're just going to brush over Thunderbolts. I'm going to give you kind of the basic premise of it. We're going to talk about a few key scenes in it, uh, and then just like the basic plot of the first two graphic novels. But this is all Warren Ellis wrote. He wrote like a one-shot that we talked about already, and then he did these uh, two graphic novels, which have six issues in them each. And, uh, and the stories are pretty neat, and his direction for Thunderbolts was very interesting. And he had a lot of like tongue-in-cheek kind of humor in it and little things that were thrown in there just for fun because uh, remember this is a world now at the marvel universe where after civil war happened everyone knows peter parker spider-man so that's going to influence one of the characters actions in this storyline which we're going to get to uh, but then also had little fun moments about um like you know tv commercials with kids toys and i'll have hopefully some of the artwork showing up there's like these commercials where it's like hey look captain america's here don't worry the thunderbolts will come and stop him he's the world's number one criminal right now boo captain america you know and it shows like kids playing with these uh these you know thunderbolts toys that are being made so norman osborne is definitely licensing his brand he's trying to get himself out there as someone who ran his own business he's very smart when it comes to business he's very smart when it comes to you know bending pr and getting things in his favor and getting people to look at him in a positive way even though 
he is a bad guy. He is the Green Goblin. He's kind of been outed as the Green Goblin. So he's kind of working in secret, but he's working as part of this new program that Iron Man and Mr. Fantastic have kind of put together where they're giving villains a second chance to sign up with the government and work for the government and help take down uh, heroes that have not been registered that are way out of control. And we're going to see a couple of those heroes in this book and then some who are just trying to live normal lives and get caught up in these horrible situations. And I really like what they do. And I think Warren Ellis really writes the living hell out of these like D-list characters. I mean, it's pretty cool. He brings American Eagle in and Jack Flag, and it's really neat. And then Steel Spider, who we're gonna get to. But it, it's it's really great to see the, the kind of the duality he writes here. He draws these, or he writes these bad guys, uh, which by the way, the art by Mike Diodato is amazing throughout these whole 12 issues is fantastic. He does a great job. And Warren Ellis kind of writes it in a way to where you have these like, you know, government people who are kind of bad and some of them want to be good, but they get caught up in being, you know, bad guys again. Uh, and they try to fool themselves and the thing into they're doing the right thing. And then you have superheroes who are kind of broken. They're kind of their faith has been lost. They see that the world has turned against them. All these selfless acts that they've done where they try to play by the rules and be good people, they see now that because of the actions of you know the new warriors and other heroes, uh, that the collateral damage has gotten too bad. And now people just don't trust you know the heroes that haven't been trained or aren't licensed by the government to go out there and fight crime. So you have guys like Jack Flagg who are really railing against it. He wants to do good in his neighborhood and he wants to help people when there are people you know in need of help but his hands are tied and his girlfriend doesn't want him to get involved and he's trying really hard to not get involved, but ultimately he does put on the costume again and get involved. And what this does was this attracts the Thunderbolts. So the Thunderbolts who are sitting around in their you know, mountain or whatever, Thunderbolts Mountain, and they're getting their orders. Uh, you, you're learning throughout the first issue kind of who the team is, getting a little bit more about them. You see Swordsman is kind of dealing with some personal issues and he wants to do the right thing, but he's kind of struggling with it. And then you have like kind of the power struggle between Moonstone and Songbird of who is the leader in the field. It's supposed to be Moonstone, but Songbird is an original Thunderbolts member and she kind of thinks she should be the leader. So there's some drama there going on. You have Norman Osborn who's slowly losing, losing his mind. He's taking pills and everything to try to stay sane. Is, that's what's kind of going on. The government has given him pills. And as, you know, as long as he takes them, He's a pretty rational person and he's very strategic and he, you know, he knows how to bend the PR, you know, the PR and the press that they get. So he's, he's very on point, but throughout the series, he is starting to lose it a little bit and it goes into overdrive in the second arc that we're going to talk about. Um, so you have that going on. Then you have Matt Gargan, who is still adapting to the Venom suit. He, he really liked it at first and he was written in a way where it was like a kid with a new toy. And so he was like, I was a scorpion, but now I have this new power as Venom and I get to do new cool things with it. But now it's starting to really it's like weighing on him. He's he's starting to see that there's like this dark side to the symbiote and it's a side that's always wanted to be let out. And he, you know, was like, well, should I let it out? And, you know, and he's kind of dealing with that. And then every time he does, it's like, uh, it's pulling a piece of him away. He, he feels like maybe somewhere in him, there's still a human being, but uh, he's it's fighting the symbiote big time. Uh, so it looks like they may not be as compatible of a match as they originally thought. And as we know, the suit used to feed off Eddie Brock and off his cancer and off other things. It doesn't really have anything like that to feed off of Matt Gargan. So Matt complains about what the suit feels like. He says it's cold at times when it's inside of him, but then when it's outside of him, he's burning hot. And there's all these different things that he's trying to adjust to, and he's not really uh, liking the experience. Um, and then you also have other members, Radioactive Man, who's you know has his power to where he leaks radiation wherever he goes. So he has to wear this containment suit. But if it gets a rip in it, everyone around him could get you know hurt severely. So uh, you have that, and then you have Robbie Williams uh, or Robbie Baldwin. Sorry. And Robbie Baldwin is uh, is obviously our friend Speedball from the New Warriors. And we talked about him before, where after causing the event in Stanford that led to Civil War happening, uh, now he's one of the only survivors of his team, the main survivor of his team of the New Warriors. And now he has an, his powers have changed in a way due to uh, the traumatic situation he went through. And his powers aren't uh, there easily used to help people now. He has to actually cut himself to activate his power, but it manifests in a new way and he shoots these intense energy beams. And so he's, you know, it's just a team of broken people. Uh, and then obviously we have Bullseye as well. And Bullseye is like their ace in the hole in case anything goes wrong or anything goes off script, they use him to like take down the, the problem. But he has to be brought in in a cloak and brought in secretive because if the press find out he's on the team, then they're gonna lose all credibility. So you have all these pieces in place and Warren Ellen, uh, Ellis does a great job uh, balancing all of them. And then you have them going after Jack Flagg. So Jack Flagg, like I said, he's trying really hard not to get involved. 
uh, with people and helping people, but he ultimately puts on his costume and goes out there and helps people and the Thunderbolts get wind of him and they come to his hometown looking for trouble. And he selflessly puts his girlfriend in a car and is like, go, get out of here. They're, they're not going to come after you if they get me. I'm going to lead them this way. And she's like, please, no, you know, Jack, don't do this. And he's like, I got to, I love you. You got to go. And so he runs back and kind of heroically throws himself into the battle with the Thunderbolts. And he puts up a really good fight. I mean, this is a guy who admired Captain America, even trained and fought by Captain America. So he is doing everything he can to survive. He's picking up sewer lids and throwing them at people, trying to knock them down to, you know, keep himself alive. Uh, he's doing everything he can, but unfortunately it's not enough. And what happens is he gets cornered and Bullseye comes up behind him and stabs him right in the back and paralyzes him. And now Jack Flagg has been captured uh, by the Thunderbolts. And so it goes back to Norman Osborn popping pills. He's like, all right, another mission done. It got a little sloppy there for a second. You know, I thought the team was going to lose. You know, Venom almost lost control. We have a lot of problems. I, we still got to work out with his team. But they overall did a good job. So, you know, come on back home. You guys did great. And uh, you deserve some R&R &R time. Continuing the tongue-in-cheek attitude of this book, Warren Ellis does put in a few more TV commercials every couple issues, which I really like. There's one with, like, uh... Uh, Uncle Sam, but it's it's Stan Lee dressed up as Uncle Sam, and he's like, hey, Excelsior, everybody, make sure you pick up the new Thunderbolts toys or whatever, and it's pretty neat that they kind of throw in these little things, but also they serve as a story point to show how much of a grasp Norman Osborn has on the press and on the media and how his perception is. You know, everyone thinks he's fighting the good fight, and he's actually rehabilitated and working for the government, so it's uh, pretty interesting, and then although each state in Civil War, uh, each state has their own, you know, government sanctioned super team. For some reason, the Thunderbolts can kind of go out of their jurisdiction sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes they do it without getting permission, and that causes some problems too. But for the most part, you know, they ask for permission before they go somewhere to help take down a, a, a superhero that is unregistered, or even a villain if, that, if that's the case. But then you have like American Eagle uh, popping up, and then I think this woman named Jillian Woods who has like these, uh, dark shade powers like where she can control like night and stuff and then you have ollie uh, ollie osnick who is the steel spider and he now learned that peter parker is spider-man and that inspired him to put the costume back on and he's moved to phoenix arizona and now he's starting up again as the steel spider to fight back against crime uh, but he knows that his activity is going to eventually attract the Thunderbolts. And Spider-Man's one of his greatest enemies, the Green Goblin. So Steel Spider is kind of preparing for that. And he's loading up. He, he has like the, those big metal arms, like Dr. Octopus style. Uh, but he's putting like actual guns in them. And he's like, you know what? I'm not going to get caught by surprise. They're going to think I'm a goody little two-shoes. They, they're going to come by and think I'm just like a regular average Joe who's trying to do the right thing. But I will kill them all. And he's like, I'll do this for you, Peter Parker. And so he's kind of losing it. Uh, but he also sees the, you know, that Peter Parker was just an average dude he's like wow well, you know spider-man was just a guy a new yorker and so that you know even though steel spider already kind of had an infatuation with spider-man and already was kind of a fan of him uh, he sees this now and is like, all right. So he goes to to the gym. He's not like an overweight dude anymore. He's like ripped and ready to fight. And now he has guns in his, uh, his steel spider arm. So he's ready for a fight. But meanwhile, he's making so much noise that American Eagle is like, all right, I should go and talk to this guy. Because if I don't, he could get killed or something bad could happen to him like Jack Flagg. And I don't want that to happen to anyone else because that was pretty brutal and that was put on TV. And even though the you know Thunderbolts tried to cover it up the best they could, there's still some things that got out there, some rumors, some you know phone footage and stuff. And he's like, I don't trust the Thunderbolts and I'm going to go try to save this guy's life before he gets attacked. And so when he shows up, Steel Spider is about to be attacked by the Thunderbolts. He's made too much noise now in Arizona. And so, you know, American Eagle's like, all right, dude, like, I got to do this. Like, I, I got to I gotta help you fight these guys. And so the two of them get into this fight. And, of course, first thing, Venom jumps down and Steel Spider puts the, you know, arm right to his face, opens it up, gun comes out, shoots Venom right in the face. Uh, and so Venom's like, ah, oh, you mother, you know, and he, like, falls off a building or something. And, uh, and the two of them get into it. And obviously that wouldn't hurt Venom too, too much. But it is point blank, and it's like a magnum. So I'm sure it did it. it. I'm sure Venom felt it. It may not have hurt him too much, but I'm sure he felt it. So he falls off the building. It kind of distracts him for a minute, but it also pisses him off to the point where he gets superhuman now. Every time uh, Matt Gargan gets really, really mad or upset, he loses control of the symbiote. He's still struggling to fight for control. And so the symbiote turns, you know, grows uh, like a foot or two in size, becomes a big monster and attacks. And uh, then as this is all going on, Jillian uh, Woods is just happened to be coming by. And she looks over and sees that this battle is happening. And she's like, you know, I'm here for a job interview and I want to get out of the country because I'm a superhuman person and I don't want to register. So I'm going to try to, you know, get myself out of the country. And to do that, I might have to take a job at Roxxon or somebody so they can, you know, send me out of here. 
So she's just happens to be in town uh, while this, you know, is going on and she sees it happening. She's like, all right, screw it. I can't let these two guys die. I'm going to jump in. These are the Thunderbolts. That's Venom. I can't let this happen. So she goes up against Venom at first and it kind of, you know, irritates the symbiote to kind of be blindsided in a way by this weird power that she has. Uh, but ultimately he fights through and he goes right to Steel Spider. He's pissed off now and he grabs Steel Spider's arm and bites it right off in public, in front of people, in front of cameras, in front of everything. So obviously instantly PR nightmare here. And he even spits out um, a chunk of the, um, like the metal pieces that it's on his armor. Like he, like, you know, he has some metal gauntlets on and Venom even spits those out in front of everybody. And uh, it's pretty brutal. And so of course now the public is like, what the heck? And meanwhile, American Eagle tells Jillian, he's like, look, we're going to lose this fight. If you have a way to get out of here, I, I heard you're leaving the country. Like you need to take off, go now. And she's like, but I need to, I'll stay and fight with you. And he goes, don't do that. Get out of here now before they start hunting you down. I'll let them chase me. So he's kind of like, all right, I'm going to make the sacrifice play, kind of like how Jack Flagg did. Uh, but this time, American Eagle has something up his sleeve, and he is ready to fight. And it turns out he's not as D-list as everyone thinks he is. So when he gets back to his motorcycle and he's getting ready to leave, and the team has been, you know, pretty much defeated, hit with the shadow powers, and then Venom got electrocuted because after he bit off the arm, they were like, Moonstone's like, no, we can't have this, you know, the press can't see this. So she shuts him down. Some of the other teammates get taken down. Swordsman gets taken down. All of them get beaten up. And then it's the only, American Eagle's the only one getting away, but then Bullseye shows up, and he throws a knife right towards American Eagle's back, right towards the spot and American Eagle spins around, catches it, and just beats the living crap out of Bullseye. Uh, he even plays some mind games. He goes, go ahead, I'll give you the first shot. And then Bullseye goes in, and then American Eagle just dodges it, punch, 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 kick, 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 knocks him the heck out. And then Bullseye's like, wait, you said I'd get the first punch. And American Eagle's like, yeah, I lied. <laughs> you know, and, and Bullseye's like, you heroes aren't supposed to do that. And he goes, he goes, trust me, what I'm about to do to you, I ain't no hero. And he just starts beating the crap out of Bullseye, and it is intense. He even slaps him one time. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, and then uh, Bullseye, they find out he's off the reservation. He's attacking someone. They don't know who because they can't get a satellite over to see what's going on. So they effectively shut him down. They turn on the electricity. He starts to get electrocuted, and that gives American Eagle even more of a one-up. And American Eagle, while, he's, while Bullseye is being electrocuted, hits him numerous times again and even hits him so hard that part of his neck cracks. Uh, and so it doesn't kill him but it certainly uh, immobilized them uh, really quickly. And then with the electricity on top of that, it is not a pretty sight. And Bullseye remembering the moment when Daredevil paralyzed him and then came into his room and put a gun to Bullseye's head and said, hey, are you scared now, Bullseye? I mean, that was an awesome moment in Daredevil comics. And it showed Matt Murdock really being like, I'm tired of dealing with you. I'm going to I'm gonna have paralyze you, and then I'm going to come taunt you, and I'm going to come scare the living crap out of you so you never come after me again. Of course, that didn't work, but so you have Bullseye here actually feeling fear again, and he remembers that moment and how helpless he felt with Matt Murdock. So American Eagle gets away, and Norman Osborn is sitting there dealing with this horrible PR nightmare where he has one of his teammates seen on camera eating an arm off of a uh, superhero and uh, it doesn't look good for him. So the first arc ends with that uh, all happening and him kind of being like, uh, F these guys. And then you have also Bullseye who is in the you know hospital, he's like paralyzed and they're telling him like he may walk again and he may happen soon, uh, but it, it's a lot of trauma to him. So he's gonna be out of commission for a while. And Norman Osborn's like, great, the one guy I could have counted on to actually pull the trigger and kill somebody if I needed it in a stealth way and I just lost him off my team. So he's starting to lose control of his team and that's going good for Songbird, who kind of wants to take control of the team. And after Moonstone just screwed up this mission, it's putting her more in a position of power as we go into the second storyline. And in this one, we get, again, another dissection of the team, but from a completely different standpoint. In the first one, it was kind of them trying to do the right thing, trying to do the job they're assigned to, and ultimately their, their evilness or their wickedness kind of overcoming them and them falling apart that way. This is a little bit different. So what happens here is three other, you know, D-list superheroes, not the ones we saw in the first story, but three other ones who are just kind of tired of the Thunderbolts running around and getting carte blanche to take down superheroes and bite people's arms off and everything. These three decide to take it upon themselves to go attack the Thunderbolts at Thunderbolts Mountain, but they do it in a much more clever way than just a direct approach. What they do is they get themselves captured one at a time. So Mindwave, I believe is one of the guy's names, and two other superheroes, D-list superheroes, they all one by one get captured. So when the book starts, the first two have already been captured, and then it, it's up to Mindwave who comes in, goes into a police department, uses his psychic powers to like throw bullets and throw things all around the desks, lift the desks up, and he threatens the cops and he says, you know what, I'm gonna turn myself in. He's like, I guess you better call the Thunderbolts now. And then he 
gets on the ground, puts his hands behind his head. And of course he gets arrested. The Thunderbolts come and get him. Like not even the main team, just like uh, Moonstone and a couple agents, they come and pick him up and bring him back to Thunderbolts Mountain. And while that's going on and while they're, you know, locking these three, you know, uh, D-list heroes up, uh, on the other side, we have Robbie uh, Baldwin, who is, you know, Penance now. Uh, he used to be part of uh, the New Warriors team called Speedball, and he is being confronted by Doc Sampson. And Doc Sampson is a Hulk character who's a psychiatrist who has the powers of the Hulk in a way. He's super strong, but he doesn't transform. His hair turned green, and he grew like a few feet tall, but he's a normal dude. He's got, you know, normal, his, he's not green-skinned, he's the regular skin, and uh, and he's you know, stands above everybody, he's ta taller than everyone. And he's super strong, but he's still a psychologist. And so what he's been assigned by Mr. Fantastic, because Mr. Fantastic told Tony, hey, if you're going to put together the Thunderbolts, I want Robbie to be on the team. He's a, a broken kid. He's got a lot to deal with. And I think having him in that environment with a full-time psychiatrist will help. And of course, the psychiatrist that was on staff wasn't doing their job that well. She kind of supports Norman Osborn. She's a former villain herself. And Reed is like, I don't approve of that lady. Can we send in Doc Sampson to kind of talk to Robbie and try to you know, get through and see how his powers can manifest? Because Robbie is the only person on the team that doesn't have the nanites inside of them that control him, like Venom does and you know Bullseye does. When they get too far out of line, they can get shut down. Robbie doesn't have that, but yet he might be the most powerful person on the team because they've only tapped a small portion of his actual power. But when he gets cut or hurts himself, he can erupt and just destroy an entire city block if he wants. And we've seen him do it a couple times in a book where he's destroyed and complete environments around him and almost killed everybody around him. So Doc Sampson is coming to kind of help him get control of that and figure out how to use it without hurting himself and maybe get him back to using his original powers or the powers uh, that he has now used in the way he originally used them uh, to manifest and, and use, you know, happy thoughts in a way or just natural ability as opposed to cutting himself to use the power uh, because he knows that's not psychologically healthy for Robbie. So uh, it's pretty neat. So they're really dissecting Robbie in this storyline and they really go full force on him. But meanwhile, you have these three D-list heroes that are uh, using their powers, which they all lie about which powers they actually have, and they're kind of off the grid. They're not important enough to be main heroes that uh, that you know the Thunderbolts would have a full dossier on them. So while they're researching to see who these guys are, all of them decide to use their powers, and it turns out they're all psychics, and they're all tapping into different members of the Thunderbolts and getting them to slowly lose their minds and turn on each other. They go after Matt Gargan as he's decompressing after a mission. All of a sudden the suit, the alien suit, comes to life and it turns on him and they start arguing with each other and it's calling him weak and pathetic and he's no Eddie Brock and it's saying all these horrible things to him and he's like, no, no, no. And it's so you have the psychics not only affecting Mac, but they're also affecting the symbiote. That's how strong these three are together. And so they're really messing up the team. And you have the swordsman who's acting out of character, who's putting together his own personal army to try to take down Norman Osborn. And then Norman Osborn uh, fully loses his mind throughout these six issues and he becomes the Green Goblin again. So the guy who's supposed to be, you know, level-headed, supposed to run this team and be in charge of everything, he's slowly losing it because these psychics are in his head and they're making him see Spider-Man everywhere he goes and they're making him hear voices. And then all of a sudden he decides to fully go into the descent of madness and become the green goblin and attack his fellow teammates and some other teammates uh, they don't fully go into they don't like the, the the heroes that are mind controlling everyone they don't go after every single member they just get the ones that need that push to get uh, you know to get extra violent so even like songbird who's still kind of a good person and trying to do the right thing uh, she isn't fully affected and so she's able to stand against swordsman and Norman Osborn. And when she sees her former partner, Swordsman, get mind controlled, she worries about him. But then Norman Osborn beats the living crap out of Swordsman after Swordsman almost cuts Venom in half. So everyone's just losing their minds. Everyone's going at it. It's really fun. There's a lot of intense battles in this. And you have Swordsman stabbing Venom in the stomach and almost cutting him clean in half. Uh, so you actually see Swordsman do something cool for once. Because I like the character. But in this run, he doesn't do a lot of cool things. So it was neat to see him get a cool moment. But it doesn't last very long because Green Goblin shows up, pumpkin bombs the living crap out of him, beats him up, and then hangs him up on the wall like Jesus style. He crucifies him against the wall with these bat batarang type things in his palms. Um, so Venom's down, Swordsman's down, all this madness is going on. And meanwhile, these three heroes are just having a field day. And they're just like, you know what? This is great. We are ruining this team and we are going to expose them 
for the monsters that they are. And uh, and we're going to expose everyone who decided to sign up and work for these guys too, uh, that they're all monsters and that the world should not trust them. So they have this great plan and it's going very, very well until one of the psychics decides to try to enter Doc Samson's mind. And Doc Samson has had some of the strongest psychics in the Marvel comics in his head before. And so he knows when someone's coming into his mind, he's like, you know what? You're no Charles Xavier, you're no Jean Grey. Whoever you are trying to get in my mind, you're not gonna get in here. And he goes, Robbie, it looks like uh, things are happening out there and it looks like it's not good. I'm gonna need you to step up and be a hero and learn how to use your powers the right way. So after spending like four issues with them, training him to use his powers the right way, Robbie once again gets a grasp of his powers and goes, okay, I think I can do this. Let's go out there and save the day. So Doc Samson and Robbie go out into the madness of this, you know, anarchy that's happening in Thunderbolts Mountain to fight back. Um, and then also the final battle, though, comes down to Songbird and Norman Osborn. And he's dressed up as Green Goblin. They're going at it. He's throwing pumpkin bombs everywhere. She's using her powers of screaming to get, you know, at him. And then finally they knock each other down. They're face to face on the ground. And she just unleashes the last of her powers, screaming right into his face, ripping his mask off and uh, scarring his face and everything. And then he falls to the ground, knocked out. And she, she was like, she's sitting there fighting consciousness. And she's like, I'm not gonna fall in front of you. I'm not gonna fall. And then once Norman Osborn's out cold, she goes, finally and then she drops to the ground uh and it's just so intensely awesome i love this run i think warren ellis did a great job and you have a lot of great moments in it uh but again the venom stuff i mean venom has some great stuff he eats people in this one he goes full cannibal once his mind gets altered uh he goes and eats a bunch of guards down the you know in the like one of swordsman guards and stuff and then swordsman that's when he's forced to like cut him in half so there's a lot of crazy things that happen in this storyline, and I know a lot of people don't like this version of Venom because they're like, oh, he's a cannibal, he's a cannibal. But Max says numerous times in this, he doesn't want to eat people. It's not something he wants to do. It's not even something the suit fully wants to do, uh, but it is something that is there. It's something that they're, that comes across their mind. And so when they get angry and they lose control, Mac doesn't have the self-control that Eddie Brock apparently had. And so it causes him to eat people, you know, or eat like an arm off somebody like he did Steel Spider. So going off of that, the psychics made him eat other people. So they're like, hey, maybe there's a need or a hunger inside the suit. So we're going to go into the suit's mind and we're going to mess with it and we're going to make it hungry. We're going to make Matt Gargan think he's hungry. So whenever he gets mad, he's going to start eating people. And again, we just want that visual so that the world can see how awful these people are. Um, and the more we prove they're monsters, the more we'll, you know, we'll basically prove that uh, they don't need to be around anymore and that they'll be shut down by by Tony Stark and Mr. Fantastic. So uh, all everything's going to plan. It looks like it's going to go great, but unfortunately for the three psychics, uh, after the battle between Norman Osborn and uh, Songbird, and after the rest of the team is taken down, they completely forgot about the one team member that was knocked out unconscious, which was Bullseye. He actually does wake up, he gets back on his feet, and he goes down to the cells, uh, and he's like, hey, I woke up. No guards were around. Everyone was losing their mind. So I figured I'd come down here and kill all of our hostages. He goes, so I didn't even know you guys were down here doing psychic stuff. But now that I see that you are, uh, I'm just going to kill you all one by one. So he has like four scalp scalpels or three scalpels in his hand. And he's just walking by each one, just throwing them in, killing each one, one shot to the head. Um, and, uh, and so he ends up saving the day <laughs> without even really realizing he's doing it. He's just feeding his thirst for blood and the fact that he got full control over his body again and he wanted to flex his muscles. So he came down here to kill people and he saw these three psychics and was like, all right, I'll kill them. So when that happens, you know, he gets sent back to his room. Norman Osborn's like, hey, you did a good job. Uh, Norman Osborn's slowly, you know, regaining in his facilities, kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm back. I'm thinking clearly now. I'm taking my medicine again. Those people really did a number on us. Doc Samson is there and he's like, look, I'm not going to fully blame you for all this, Norman, because, you know, it was the work of these three people uh, who are dead now, mysteriously. We don't know how they died, uh, even though it's pretty clear Bullseye killed him. He goes, uh, but I'm going to keep an eye on you and I'm going to check in on Robbie from time to time. And Norman Osborn's like, yeah, whatever. Get the hell out of here, Doc Sampson. Um, and so uh, so you have a nice closure here. This is all Warren Ellis wrote. This is the last thing he wrote of the Thunderbolts. The next arc that we'll get into is the Secret Invasion stuff and a couple one shots. And we'll talk about that in the next uh, comic discussion episode. But for this one, I thought... Warren Ellis did a great job. I thought he balanced a lot of characters really well, and I thought he did a really good job selling me on the D-list characters. A lot of these characters just haven't been used in a while, like American Eagle and Jack Flag, Steel Spider. I mean, it was cool to see all of them, Jillian and Mindwave and those people. So it was like, it was really neat to see like these characters that no one probably cared about. And Warren Ellis was like, those are the perfect characters to use 
for this book because one, it gives me a great angle for the story of where the villains will underestimate the heroes, but it'll really make the heroes feel like the underdogs. And I think that's what he was going for here was I'm writing a team of villains, but I can't let them, like I have to make them feel like the overpowered team. And I, I have to have the heroes surprise you. If they turn out to have more power than you think, it has to be a surprise. And I really like that balance. And the way he did the first six issues, where it was the Thunderbolts being sent after specific D-list characters, and then the second one where it was a, basically a single location movie where everything took place in Thunderbolts Mountain, and it just had these three heroes getting themselves arrested and coming here, and then all the madness happening inside this uh, mountain. So for those two storylines, I think Warren Ellis did great. I wish he would have went on to write another year or two of these stories, but unfortunately what Marvel does a lot of times when books do really well and they get a lot of attention and they do interesting things, uh, they do gain the attention of what, you know, like a bigger story. So whenever Marvel's planning event books, they look at all the other books that are around and they go, all right, which of these could essentially set up or have a payoff in our event book? And I think they put their eyes on this team here. I think uh, Brian Michael Bendis and the editors at Marvel at the time were probably looking at what Warren Ellis was doing and going, you know what would be really cool is if we evolved this Thunderbolts team and we turned them into a team called the Dark Avengers. And we're going to get into how that happens uh, over the next two videos. But for the next one, we're going to focus on the story that has them turn into the world's greatest heroes. Because right now, you see they're kind of branded as monsters, they have bad PR, a lot of people don't trust them, heroes are willing to get themselves killed to come in here and ruin their plans and expose them. So Norman Osborn needs something to make it look like he's on the side of the angels again. And an opportunity arises when the scrolls invade Earth and disguise themselves as humans. So what better team to go after them and save the day than the Thunderbolts? So we're going to see them come, you know, become the questionable heroes into the world's greatest heroes in the next episode. So make sure you stay subscribed and tune in for that. Let me know what you think of this run. Have you read it yourself? Do you have a favorite moment? Is there anything I missed that you want me to talk about? We can do it in the comments below. Thanks for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.